So welcome everyone to an MEI in-person event at Shaw Foundation Alumni House. My name is Clemens Che and I'm a research fellow at the Middle East Institute here at the National University of Singapore. And today joining me is Mr. Ibrahim Ahashmi, the Director of Media and Communication Department at Qatar's Media Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So welcome Mr. Ibrahim Ahashmi. Um, just a bit of background on MEI and the series. MEI is an autonomous research institute within NUS, and our mission is to provide independent assessments that help our key stakeholders in Singapore formulate our national interests on relevant Middle East issues. We also seek to help the public better understand these national interests, and one initiative of public outreach is the reason why we are here today. Today's prospective discussion constitutes the 17th session of MEI's Bridging the Gulf series, which is a public education series that I spearhead and which is meant for public consumption aimed at raising the level of public knowledge on the Gulf Arab states. So over the course of this series, we had country-specific episodes and thematic ones ranging from culture, covering themes such as falconry, to economic strategies, for example, on food security, and some of the highlights include one of the sessions where I hosted the Saudi Assistant Minister of Hajj and Umrah to understand how technology is used in the pilgrimage. So today, on behalf of MEI, I have the immense pleasure of hosting another prominent guest speaker today, Mr. Ibrahim Al-Hashmi. So I would like to share a bit about his profile. As I mentioned earlier, he's the Director of Media and Communication at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the state of Qatar. And since joining MOFA, he served in the office of the Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs in the fields of communication, public diplomacy, and special projects. He's also a member of the Doha Forum team, the annual most prominent platform for dialogue in the region. And he also served in the permanent delegation of the state of Qatar in Geneva during the 47th and 48th sessions of the UN Human Rights Council. He served as the secretary of the media committee of the Supreme Committee for Crisis Management during the first wave of COVID-19, which worked effectively with the state authorities to develop and to follow up with the media plans related to the pandemic. The media committee also organized the press conferences of the Supreme Committee for Crisis Management. So welcome, Ms. Ibrahim al -Hashmi. Thank you very much. I'd like to say a few words about the topic today with reference to the latest developments as well as from a personal perspective a few months ago, I visited Qatar on an official study trip, which aimed to learn more about the various channels of communication domestically within Qatar and equally to Qatar's international partners. So this trip, of course, allowed me to meet Mr. Ibrahim al -Hashmi, and I invited him to speak about communication specifically, mainly because from the various meetings that I sat through, it was clear that dialogue is a mainstay of Qatar's foreign policy. Dialogue, not only as a means of resolving conflict regionally and beyond, but also in terms of establishing Doha as an interlocutor and equally as a credible partner in the international community. Some of the latest developments include the appointment of the country's foreign minister, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, as prime minister, hosting a UN meeting on Afghanistan and Doha, another development recently, and also rendering humanitarian aid to Sudan, for example. So let's hope we can touch on some of these issues. And this brings us to the conversation we have in store today. And I say conversation because the format will be as follows. It will be a dialogue. And as part of Mr. Ibrahim Al-Hashmi's opening remarks, I will put forward three questions on three different themes associated with Qatar's foreign policy. And then Mr. Ibrahim Al-Hashmi will provide the responses, following which we will open the discussion to the floor. So those in attendance can put forward your questions during the Q&A and those tuning in, of course, on Zoom can send your questions in the Zoom chat box. So without further ado, let me begin to exercise my privilege as moderator for today's discussion to ask my first question and providing some context on, on Qatar's foreign policy. So Qatar's quest to cement its place in the international arena was boosted by its success as the host of the recently concluded World Cup. Yet the country was not spared from criticism before the tournament started. And also, if 
if many of you watched the tournament towards the end of this sporting event with the prize presentation ceremony, there was also equally some criticism, criticism directed at Qatar. So how did Doha dispel this criticism? Thank you again, Clemens. It's a pleasure to be here. As I said, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, addressing your first question, but when it comes to the World Cup, we always stated that we in Qatar believe in dialogue and we are an open country. Openness and dialogue are pillars of our foreign policy. So when we were criticized about our labor rights, we opened our doors for uh, for all institutions, human rights institutions, institutions to come to Qatar and report what they're seeing. But my question is, as we're here in the university, we believe in objectivity, truth, ethics, and neutrality. Where 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 are they serving the, these purposes, or where are there other purposes that they're serving? Unfortunately, some of the reporting on the World Cup went beyond fair criticism and went into tarnishing Qatar's image, and that's very unfortunate. I'll give you one example. Do you know about the 6,500 workers? Did you hear about this numbers? number? So one uh, newspaper claimed that 6,500 workers died in Qatar. This number is absolutely false, and it's problematic in so many levels that I want to get into this is also a point that flew by Western media. They didn't report on it. We committed to safeguarding and protecting workers in our national vision, the Qatar National Vision 2030, which was launched in 2006, four years before we actually know that we're going to uh, host the World Cup or win the bid to, uh, to host the World Cup. We committed in that vision that we will safeguard and protect and improve the situation for labor workers in, in the state of Qatar. And we em embarked on that path. We received criticism. Oh, that's fair, and we engage with that criticism. But we will, uh, what we will not accept is tarnishing Qatar's image and uh, biased uh, criticism that is that go beyond fair and credible criticism of host of uh, of the situation into unfortunately racism, Islamophobia, and other elements. I'll give you an example. Did you all watch the the ending of the World Cup and the well, of Messi? That was a moment that was celebrated by fans, as I will show in the video right now. Argentina in the final 2018, France won the game. Oh, in the Arabic way, the a moment of celebration, joy, uh, grounding was a moment of pride. What can go wrong, right? Do you find anything uh, problematic with their presentation here? Anyone finding any, anything problematic about it? It was too strong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Western media went absolutely hysterical about that specific moment. Let's see. The trophy is passed into the hands of Genius into the hands of genius. Um, 
Seems a shame in a way that they've covered up Messi and his Argentina. Das war also das ist über, das war, über, äh, das übertrifft alle Erwartungen sowieso, aber auch alle Superlative, und, äh, die wir seit vielen, vielen Jahren in solchen Finals gesehen haben. Und auch diese Protagonisten, ich sag's nochmal, Lionel Messi, also da gibt's Protagonisten, ich sag's nochmal, Lionel Messi, also As I said, we accept fair criticism, but this is what we've been dealing with. This fair criticism or is this racism, Islamophobia, and other forms of manifestations of things that do not represent fair journalism. Uh, honestly speaking, the interest of the media, Western media specifically, in the labor rights in Qatar, was so disingenuous and insulting to the workers. Because as soon as the World Cup was over, they dropped the case. It was just for them a tool to advance certain agendas against Qatar, against Qatar's hosting the World Cup. But we, uh, uh, for us, th these were reforms that we uh, committed to in 2006. We have implemented, according to the ILO, Qatar is now a model in the region when it comes to uh, labor rights. Yes, we're not perfect. There's still a road to, to cross, but we have came a long way to protect and safeguard labor rights. And uh, it's a legacy that we will always be uh, proud of in Qatar, despite what the, the media, uh, media says. Uh, and uh, according to the statistics and facts, if you look at it, it was one of the most successful World Cups in the history of World Cups. Uh, we had one, more than 1.3 million. It was one of the safest uh, 1.3 million visitors. It was one of the safest World Cups. It was uh, the only World Cup maybe in the history of the World Cup to come to have all the activities in a close proximity to each other. So it was for us a moment of celebration and joy and bringing cultures and people together. This is what it was all about. It was not about uh, uh, politicizing sports or the direction that they wanted us, they wanted to drag us in. We started. We wanted to focus on sports, and this is what we did. And I think we promised to host a successful tournament, and this is what we delivered. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, and of course, if you watch the World Cup and you watch the final, you realize that it was a very memorable one where the scores was was. The score was going back and forth between the two sides in the, in the final. So it was a memorable final and it was one that Qatar, of course, you know, will remember and the rest of the world. Um, now that we're on the topic of the World Cup, you know, I'd like to ask you know, as, as a follow-up before I move completely to another topic, you know, what will be the use of the World Cup infrastructure now that the mega event is over? And, you know, what will be the, be the mandate of the Supreme Committee, which was in charge of, of this sporting event? Uh, as you know, Clemens, we are a forward-looking nation. We always have something to look forward to and events that we're hosting. So parts of the infrastructure, were, of course, uh, of course, the World Cup was an accelerator for many of the infrastructures that will be used for the country, such as the metro system and other facilities. This will be used by the people for generations to come and are beneficial for our economy and our infrastructure. Uh, the component of the legacy is very important for uh, the World Cup. So uh, uh, some of the stadiums will be dismantled completely and will be given to uh, other countries, uh, such as the 974 stadium. Parts, the, the chairs and other stadiums will also be uh, donated to uh, other countries. And some will be uh, turned into facilities, uh, community facilities that will be used by the community in certain cities, such as Al-Khor and al -Wakra. Thank you, Ibrahim. I think we'll move on to another topic altogether, which is on Syria, which is now the uh, you know, the latest development in, in the Middle East. And Syria is now back in the Arab League after 12 years. But before the vote on Syria's readmission, you know, the Qatar's prime minister said the original regions to suspend Syria's membership still exist. So to what extent does this signify a break from the Arab consensus? Uh, as you know, we are in Qatar, a country of uh, principles and our foreign policy is principled and guided by our values. We have always stressed that our position in Syria uh, is, is respected the aspirations of the Syrian people and fulfilled the, these aspirations. 
whether when it comes to the refugees crisis, humanitarian crisis, or the political solution. We have not seen any significant progress in these fields that would lead to the normalization with the regime in Syria. We respect the desire of our Arab brothers, and we hope that it will lead to a change in Syria. It, it will be a motive for the regime to change its behavior. But for us, normalization is off the table unless we see con concrete changes on the ground. And this is, by the way, our uh, our position, which is consistent across the board. For example, Qatar does not normalize ties with Israel, despite having some dialogue with it when it comes to aid to Gaza and uh, uh, maintaining calm in the Strip. But we do not normalize our ties because our position is very clear and has been consistent throughout the year. Thank you. And of course, we move from your region to, you know, the global trend now or the global hot topic now, which is about US-China competition. And Qatar is host to the al Udaid base, the largest US military base in the Middle East. And last year, Qatar was also designated as a major non-NATO ally by the US. And at the same time, there have been recent important gas deals with China, notably Sinopec's uh, stake in Qatar's North Field East. So this also follows a 27-year LNG deal last November. So my question is, how does Qatar manage its relations with the two superpowers? You know, What is the kind of message, since we are on the topic of communication, what is the kind of message conveyed to the two big players? Uh, I will answer your question in two folds. One that relates to Qatar and the US and China immediately, and the other fault that has to do with the state of, of, uh, of uh, our world and uh, politics. Uh, to answer your immediate question, Qatar does not see a conflict in its relationship uh, with the US and with uh, China. As you know, uh, international relations are not mutually exclusive. So the US is uh, our strategic ally. As you said, we are the host of uh, al Hadid base. We coordinate on important issues such as uh, counter-terrorism, regional affairs, regional stability. Uh, we we enjoy a robust bilateral relation, whether it's an education and energy sector. Uh, China is also an important uh, partner for us, and they're, they're one of the main export uh, importer of our uh, LNG. And our relationship with them is uh, growing in in a, in a number of fields, mainly trade and the economy. So we do not see a conflict in, in that relationship. Uh, and uh, the other fault, and it does not relate to uh, the U.S. and China immediately, it, it has to do with the status of the world. It seems that there is a, a value that is often overlooked in international uh, politics and international relations, which is humility. We are always talking about a race to something, a race to the moon, a race to 5G, a race to AI. Uh, the examples are, uh, there are many examples in this field. I think it's about time that we stop, take a breath, reevaluate our situation, uh, talk to each other, and small countries like Qatar and Singapore can play this role. If we think about our past, why is history doomed to repeat itself? Ancient civilizations have flourished and now they're gone. But now we cannot afford to repeat the same mistakes of the past because the stakes are now higher. Uh, we, humanity has never had this much access to uh, wealth, resources, technology, weaponry. So our responsibility is now higher than ever before be because our very being is at stake here. So we have to work with with each other, provide uh, the platform for, platforms for dialogue, for understanding, bridging the gaps. Small to medium powers uh, like Qatar and Singapore, as I said, play a very important role in this, and can play an important role in the in the years to come, because the common threats that. Uh, face of humanity now, uh, uh, threats our very being and the planet that we are entrusted to to protect. Uh, we in Qatar, as a, as, a, as a trusted international partner, believe that dialogue is the only viable and practical alternative to conflicts. We have seen throughout history how conflicts did not yield results, only yielded in destruction, uh, civilian losses, and uh, civiliz civilizations that now do not exist. Is this the future we want, or is the, or will we be a responsible partners in advancing a global peace and uh, prosperity? Thank you, Ibrahim. And I want to ask one last question, and I'm going to reevaluate my position as moderator because I was supposed to only ask three, and I want to ask one more, and this will be on Afghanistan because your Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman Al Thani made his first official trip to Kandahar 
uh, in Afghanistan just last week. And you know, on the other hand, the Taliban spokesman also put out a request for Qatari investments in Afghanistan. So what was the purpose of the PM's visit? Will there be investments? And also, I would like here to, to do a shout out to Her Excellency Lolo al Khater, who was heavily involved in the, in the US withdrawal from Afghanistan as well. And she was on our SR Nader Distinguished Lecture in 2020. So a shout out to her as well. And so my question to you on Afghanistan, please. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, the visit of uh, His Excellency, the Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, reiterate our position as an impartial mediator in the Afghanistan uh, conflict and uh, and file. It's the first high-level visit at the level of uh, PM to, to meet with the acting Prime Minister of Afghanistan. It also serves as a reminder for the international community to not abandon Afghanistan. We have always stressed that the, the dialogue and open channels with the acting government are essential and critical to help and support the Afghan people. So the visit comes in that context. We reiterated our position and our support for all sects of the Afghan people, especially women, girls, minorities. And uh, we encourage the international community to keep to, to, to keep engaging with Afghanistan okay. on all levels to, to support the Afghan people in their uh, way to a question. Thank you, Ibrahim. And I would like to now open the discussion to the floor. So if you have a question, just simply raise your hand on. And for those tuning in on Zoom, you can send your questions in through the chat box, which I will then receive on, on my phone here and I can read out. So our first question to my colleague, Aisha Sarihi, please. Um, thank you very much, Clemens. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, uh, for the overview of Qatar position in different aspects. Uh, I am Aisha al sarihi I'm a research fellow at the Middle East Institute, uh, and I focus on the issues of the climate and the environment and the energy transition um, with a focus on the Arab region and the MENA region uh, broadly. Um, I, I have two questions. Uh, one is on the sustainability and the World Cup. Um, so again, back to the criticism, and this again has been brought also before the World Cup happened and during the World Cup. Um, I would like to hear from you, um, what are the highlights of sustainability initiatives that Qatar has uh, implemented during the World Cup? And have these uh, had any last uh, long lasting legacy after the World Cup in Qatar? Um, and then the second question is on the international relations. It's, uh, um, I'm from Oman uh, originally. Uh, so we know like Qatar and Oman uh, have uh, good relationships with Iran, uh, but probably they have difference uh, in their relationship with Iran. How would you differentiate the position of Qatar compared to Oman when it comes to Iran? Thank you. Thank you very much. To your first question, I'm not an environmental uh, expert, but I know that we compare the Qatar World Cup being held in uh, almost one city to the next World Cup, which will be held in three different countries. Which one has a less economic, for, for, uh, sorry, carbon footprint? The Qatar World Cup has a way less uh, carbon footprint. First of all, because we aspired for it to be carbon neutral. Second of all, because of Qatar's location. Uh, being in the centers and the flights coming to Qatar. The metro that we have used is uh, energy efficient and uh, it runs by uh, electricity, so not by uh, fossil fuels. And uh, the cooling technology used in the stadium was also uh, environment friendly. These are some examples uh, to name, uh, but I think uh, the single most beneficial thing for the environment was having uh, all the activities in approximate uh, geography to each other compared to the, the next World Cups, I, I know that they're going to follow with the three countries, uh, two three countries uh, model. So the Qatar World Cup compared to others was definitely uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, to your second question, I cannot, of course, speak uh, on behalf of Oman, but we in Qatar believe, as I said, in, in dialogue and keeping open channels. Iran is our neighbor and we share with them our North gas field, the largest gas field in the world known to humanity uh, as of now. So uh, keeping dialogue with them is essential. And ex we express our disagreements with them with, uh, in, in various files, whether with, when it comes to Syria, Yemen, 
uh, and uh, other uh, other conflicts. But we express them diplomatically and through the diplomatic channels, and we maintain a good relationship with them uh, bilaterally, which is important for us. As we as we said, they are they are our neighbor. We share our uh, North Gas field with them, so. Uh, Engaging with them is important for uh, regional stability and uh, the stability of our region and beyond. We, Qatar, is, Qatar also played a role facilitating uh, some of the dialogue between the U.S. and Iran because we believe reaching a deal is for the greater benefit of the region. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, we have another question from the floor. Before we proceed to take one question on Zoom. Um, thank you, Mr. Hashmi. I very much enjoyed uh, listening to um, your words about uh, the Qatar World Cup. And um, honestly, uh, just uh, before my question, before my question, just a remark that um, uh, I fully understand that, uh, your indignation about what happened with regard to the Bisht, because I I fully see that this was this was a gesture of hospitality. However, uh, one of the things that in our world uh, is um, a major source of irritation and problems is that cultures do not understand each other. This, I don't think that the reactions had to do anything with Islamophobia. No, it was a misperception of what happened. And I think uh, we all together have to do uh, to uh, help minimize uh, cultural misunderstandings because they can uh, snowball into something much bigger, uh, which we definitely need to avoid. Uh, now, my question, um, Qatar uh, has uh, great influence, influence very much beyond its size in international affairs. Um, one of the areas where Qatar has contributed was the search for a solution over Afghanistan. We know perfectly well that what went on in Afghanistan they could not go on further. And um, I believe that um, Qatar was led by good intent to help find uh, an exit from this situation. However, what we see now in terms of the situation of women in Afghanistan is simply intolerable. Can Qatar use its very uh, substantial weight towards the Taliban to alter this situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for your question. First of all, I fully agree with your uh, comment, whether it was a misunderstanding or, or Islamophobia. I think we should uh, engage in dialogue and understanding each other. This is the only way forward. When it comes to uh, Afghanistan, uh, as you know, the world has boycotted Taliban before, and this did not yield in any results when it comes to women rights or girls education. Mm -hmm. So uh, we stress on the importance of uh, keeping channels open with them and engaging with them in dialogue. And uh, we always say to uh, the acting government, whether it's uh, on record or in, in meetings, that Qatar is a model for a Muslim country where women, that a country that adheres to Islam and follows Islamic principles, and where women enjoy their right to education, work, and the full life in the public sector. And we hope that maybe their time in Doha would encourage them to revisit their position, but we, our position is very clear and we keep engaging with them in that. And we hope the international community will also place, place pressure on the acting government to uh, rectify these uh, laws and uh, policies. On Thank you, Ibrahim. And that was a question from my colleague, uh, Diorji Bustin, who is a visiting professor at the Institute. Uh, we have, Couple of questions coming in now online. And there's one from uh, Jose Monteclaros. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. And he's from uh, RSIS at the Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. So his question is What lessons can Qatar share with other small states from a food security perspective, which can be relevant to Singapore and other small states? Uh, Qatar, uh, Qatar now is the first in the region and the 13th globally, 12th or 13th globally when it comes to uh, food security. We have embarked on the uh, journey of uh, the, uh, having our food security secured and sufficient uh, ever since uh, the GCC crisis when we found our land border closed. So we had to uh, rely on ourselves and uh, find alternatives. 
uh, that's when we boosted national our national security when it comes to food security. Um, uh, we have Baladna, one of the biggest, uh, I think you visited Baladna. Yes, yes one of the biggest uh, uh, producers of uh, milk and dairy products in, in Qatar. And in other fields also, we are trying to be self-sufficient and uh, diversifying our supply chain. This is also important to uh, to uh, food security is first 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 component is having your uh, uh, boosting your national capabilities and the second one is uh, diversifying uh, your uh, supply chains in case of a conflict like the one that uh, happened in Ukraine which had a significant effect on food security globally uh, these two components coming together uh, plus good policies and good governance I think would uh, help small states achieve their food security. Thank you, Ibrahim. And of course, an update to the food security strategy as I had a chance to speak with uh, Dr. Masood Ajari, the director of the food security department at the Ministry of Municipality. We have another question on uh, sports, incidentally. So the question is, prominent Qatari businessman Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani submitted a third bid to buy Manchester United Football Club. Uh, number one, is this a re reflection of Qatar's ambition in sport? And number two, does, does this receive encouragement from the authorities participating in, in sports activities? Uh, I believe uh, Sheikh uh, Jasm is uh, acting in his uh, capacity as a private businessman. So I don't have any further information on the, on the deal at the time being. Okay, thank you. And, and also, another question, if I may, Ibrahim. Uh, is there even a remote possibility that Qatar would establish diplomatic relations with Israel in the future? Uh, our position on the normalization with Israel depends on uh, the Arab Peace Initiative and uh, the achieving the Palestinian independent state with East journalism as uh, its capital, resolving issues such as the right of return and uh, respecting and safeguarding the rights of Palestinians. Unless there is a significant progress in this uh, uh, fields. Once Israel respects Palestinians uh, and respects their right to a state and the, their right to dignity and uh, a, a prosperous life, if uh, these conditions are not achieved, I, I think normalization will be off the table. Thank you, Ibrahim. And I think you made it clear earlier also on, on your approach, on Qatar's approach on, on normalization of relations. Uh, I have one more question coming in from Zoom again. I believe this is from uh, Asif Shuja. Uh, and the question is, Mr. Ibrahim, as you primarily deal with Qatar's communications with the outside world, could you share with us if there are some fine lines that need to be taken into consideration, for example, to incorporate nuances of the domestic population? Can you share with us Qatar's best practices in this regard? I think, as you know, we live in a very interconnected world where you cannot really hide or manipulate your message. So transparency is key. And uh, transparency uh, creates credibility and creates uh, uh, a trustworthy image that, that of, uh, of, of the nation. So it's important to uh, communicate clearly, to communicate efficiently, to stay on top of things, to not give a chance for, for, uh, for rumors to, to play, and to uh, reiterate uh, what, what matters to you. Thank you. And I think you, you talk about this information and I think that, that was what your answer implied. And and I guess with a current pause from the from the floor on, on Zoom, if I may put forward another question since you're talking about this information, of course, we are aware that uh, during the, the blockade recently, the, the initial attack was a cyber one on Qatar news agency. So what are what were the steps taken later on to subsequently address this issue? of this information and also cybersecurity. Whether it was in the GCC crisis or other crises, our position was always that we are transparent, clear, consistent, and uh, straight to the point. Uh, I don't like to dwell on the GCC crisis because we are a forward-looking nation and uh, something in the past since uh, signing an ULA agreement, we're focusing on you now improving the relations and having uh, good relations with, the, with, our, with our neighbors. Um, but definitely there are many lessons learned for all parties in this. Uh... Thank you, Ibrahim. I see a hand on the floor, so I think we can 
pass the microphone to her. Thank you, Your Excellency. I just want to maybe uh, change the context of Dr. Chase's question. Um, uh, maybe talk about the infodemic during the pandemic itself. Like, how do you deal with mis and disinformation during that period, which is very crucial. And also maybe just if you could just touch on the Hokumi um e-government that you have, because during the pan um, pandemic, it actually advanced and accelerated digitalization efforts in a lot of countries. So what are the um, safeguards you have put in place with regards to that? Thank you. So so during the pandemic, especially the first wave of the pandemic, there, there were a lot of misinformations taking place. So we had to do daily press conferences. It was on daily basis to inform the public of the numbers, of the status of the health sector, of the, it was a new virus and we were learning new things about it every day. So about the practices and how to protect themselves and their families. We were doing it on a daily basis uh, to ensure clarity in the messaging and to ensure that all the questions are answered. So we had a team that, that was monitoring social media, the main questions and trends and what people are concerned about. And we try to get answers from the relevant uh, government entities, whether it's the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of uh, Trade. And we put answers to these questions in the press conference. The press conference was the main platform. And then we dismantled the message through social media channels. Uh, uh, during the first wave, this was crucial because the information was changing and the numbers were changing on a on, on daily basis. For example, if you remember during the very first days, there was a debate about the efficiency of the mask. And then uh, uh, World Health Organization recommended that people wear, wear masks. So it was important that we were on top of things so the public is uh, informed. We also had some closures in Qatar and uh, social distancing measures that had to be announced. Uh, and uh, the important thing uh, there that we, and our main message in it was, uh, it all depends on the collaboration of the people with the government. And if we are, uh, if people collaborate with the government, we can, ease the restrictions as soon as possible and life would go back to uh, normal. Uh, so staying on top of things definitely helped with the misinformation. Otherwise, I think we were seeing um, mixed messaging coming, coming from uh, different channels, unfortunately. Thank you, Ibrahim. I think we have another question from Aisha. Thank you again. Um, so um, I have a question uh, on the regional cooperation. As we know, most recently, Iran and Saudi Arabia has a, a you know, signed an agreement uh, and uh, one of the mandates was to revive the security and economic cooperation agreement that has been signed like almost 20 years ago. Um, however, looking at that agreement, uh, I think from my point of view, it needs to be updated. And then there is no element for environmental and then climate cooperation. Um, I would like to ask you, do you think that there is an opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, include the environment and climate cooperation between the GCC and Iran? And if so, uh, how do you think that Qatar can play a role in that? Thank you very much. Uh, from Qatar's point of view, the existence of dialogue is better than the absence of it. So we welcome any talks or, or uh, mechanisms in the region that would encourage dialogue and would, would encourage and uh, enhance regional stability. I would agree with you that uh, re uh, climate and environmental sustain sustainability are important elements, especially nowadays uh, with the threat of uh, climate change. But I don't have an immediate answer, unfortunately, whether it will be implemented as part of the agreement between Qatar and uh, between Qatar, the GCC, and uh, the Iran. But I definitely uh, see see the value of it and uh, recognize the importance of having uh, such a component in the in, in the regional security pact. Thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, I want to come back to your response earlier, and you said that of course, intra-Gulf relations, the best way to move is forward. And of course, you, you, you drew reference to the Alula Summit in January 2021 that kick-started a, a process of reconciliation. Uh, but the reassumption of diplomatic relations bilaterally, bilaterally between Qatar and the UAE and the other set between Qatar and Bahrain have been largely unhurried. You know, is there a reason for this? And you know, what can we expect in the near future? Thank you, Clemens. Uh, Al Ula agreement stated that bilateral mechanisms will be established between the various countries to address uh, issues of, of concern. 
So each uh, we had a bilateral mechanism with each country of uh, that that signed the ala. Uh, the relations were moving at different paces depending on the outcomes of the of the meetings. As you know, the relations with the Saudi Arabia are uh, growing at a very uh, excellent pace, and we have restored uh, full cooperation in uh, various uh, fields. Also, uh, we are very optimistic about the prospects with the UAE. The, emb embassy, the embassies are going to open very, very soon between Qatar and uh, the UAE. We have also uh, uh, reinitiated uh, the relations with the Bahrain and the flights will resume between the two countries uh, on the 25th of uh, May. So to, uh, the, as, as long as I think we have the mechanisms of dialogue and they're working and they're effective, things will take time through their uh, normal and uh, pragmatic channels to, to be restored. But uh, uh, as long as we're moving forward, I think this is the, the way that we want to head to. That's very good to hear. A lot of optimism there. Uh, and since we're on the topic of diplomacy, back again, you know, we have a question from Zoom by uh, Pirasan Dichachisapskon. If I, I hope I got your name right. Uh, and her question is on soft power. And I will build on that question by adding one of my own. Uh, because her question is about what kind of soft power does Qatar and employ and see as a key factor in its success? And I would go in to add one more question on culture. You know, is does culture, you know, feature as an element of Qatar's foreign policy? Because just recently, Sheikha Al Mayasa Thani, the chairperson of Qatar Museum, said at a conference that you know, cultural institutions and creativity are central to progress. So, how do you see culture and soft power working together in in, in your foreign policy? Thank you, Clemens. They're definitely intertwined and they, they come hand in hand uh, together. Uh, for us as a small country, we, we fully realize that we will never be a, a hard power. We will never be a military power. So a soft power is uh, essential to our national security and our, uh, our immediate uh, stability and uh, national interests. So uh, we, are, we, we always encourage dialogue. We encourage uh, resolving conflicts through peaceful means. <laughs> And uh, we utilize our resources uh, uh, and we put our resources in that uh, direction. Uh, His Highness uh, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad in his uh, UN uh, speech uh, described, described it beaut beautifully. He said that Qatar is a uh, trusted energy supplier and a peace facilitator. Uh, as you as you as you've seen in the different conflicts of the uh, world, for example, the energy poverty in uh, Europe when it happened, Qatar was there to to help. With the evacuation from Afghanistan, Qatar was there to help. Whether it's between US and Iran encouraging dialogue, Qatar is there to help. So we definitely believe in the value of the dialogue. And it's not something that we just believe in. It's something that we actively pursue and, uh, and push because we believe it, that it is in, in our direct national interest and in the national interest and the regional interest and the interest of international uh, peace and security. So, um, and we have many initiatives in uh, in, uh, in this regard, whether it's uh, through our mediation efforts or the conferences that we host in, in Doha to encourage uh, dialogue. We just recently hosted the international, I think it was it, uh, the recent edition of the uh, conference between uh, the encouraging dialogues between uh, the different uh, religions. Uh, so there's that. And when it comes to culture, we, we uh, place a great importance on cultural uh, dip diplomacy. One example of that is uh, we uh, yearly, annually, we have the Qatar uh, culture year with one of the countries. Recently, it was one uh, one with the Middle Eastern countries and celebration of the region. And uh, we do it every year to highlight culture and create further understanding between them. Thank you. And if you haven't been to Doha to see the Museum of Islamic Art and the National Museum of Qatar, you probably should. Because those are two wonderful and iconic uh, museums and cultural institutions. Of, of Qatar. Um, I want to go back to you know your your assessment of Qatar's role as a facilitator for dialogue. You know, how would you describe Qatar's degree of success specifically in mediation? Mm -hmm. uh, there are many factors that would uh, that come in when we talk about uh, mediation. First of all, Qatar only mediates any conflict when it's asked by all parties. So when when all parties ask Qatar to mediate a conflict, that's when we step in. And uh, Qatar is a trusted partner because the, uh, the international community realizes that Qatar comes in impartially and has no gain from resolving these conflicts other than 
enhancing uh, international peace and security, uh, especially as a small state. This is a, this brings me back to my point that small states can bring in because they realize that you do not have an expansionist agenda or you do not have any uh, hidden agenda when resolving conflicts or trying to mediate conflicts. Uh, it's a it's a role that small states can play. This makes Qatar a trusted partner. It's the ability to talk to all parties. It's the ability to uh, bring uh, views uh, closer together. And uh, as I said, without any political immediate political gains from these uh, from resolving these conflicts, other than enhancing uh, international peace and security. Thank you. And Ibrahim, I I stated in my introduction, you know. Uh, very briefly that, you know, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman al Thani has now been appointed as the Prime Minister. And he, you, you briefly also mentioned that he gave a live televised speech. So, you know, what kind of impact will he play in this new role as, as Prime Minister and also the coordinator for foreign policy? Uh, the Prime Minister in his first televised interview stressed that uh, foreign policy will remain as a pillar of uh, Qatar's overall uh, approach, whether it's domestically or uh, globally, because we realize its importance for our national security and uh, uh, its importance for uh, our regional stability. So we will continue to play our role as a facilitator and uh, uh, in the region and uh, and beyond. Uh, domestically, His Excellency will uh, build on the legacies of uh, Qatar's government, whether it's in the fields of economy, tourism, investments. To uh, to uh, further boost these fields and learn from the lessons of the past to to uh, enhance our policy making locally. Thank you. And if I may, because you you were talking about mediation and you also mentioned the JCPOA earlier. So can you tell us where this is going right now, and and you know what can we expect to see in, in the future and Qatar's role as well? Uh, I unfortunately do not have an update. Okay. Now. Okay. So, uh, any further? Qu I've been taking too much time as a moderator now because I've been he's been indulging in my questions. Uh, I think we have one more hand on the floor uh, to to pose a question. Thank you very much uh, uh, because that is uh, so important in the uh, mediation in the region. And the, and, uh, I cannot avoid asking this uh, as a person with a with the past in the United Nations. Unfortunately, the UN is one of the major victims of uh, the current uh, tragic uh, uh, war triggered by Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, the uh, very difficult situation of um, uh, one uh, permanent security council member uh, being involved uh, in uh, clear aggression has made the United Nations face very difficult situation in terms of making decisions. I wonder if Qatar, uh, together with other well-meaning uh, uh, countries interested in restoring peace and stability the world over, can help the United Nations more because Qatar has been punching above its weight in helping the UN agencies. But also, I believe Qatar could do a lot in terms of restoring the standing of the nations which has suffered a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, we have also, so, sir, we've been vocal about our support for the UN as an institution. We believe uh, multilateral institutions are important and uh, uh, they, they, they play a great, a great importance in many fields. But at the same time, um, the reform is essential. And we have also been very vocal, vocal about, uh, about the importance of uh, reforms in the UN security councils and UN institutions. To, to play a, a more proactive role in, in resolving uh, conflicts. So this is something that we fully agree on. Do we have uh, further questions from, from Zoom? I, I'm not sure whether the, the chat is showing up. Any questions, further questions on the floor before I have... Okay, Aisha, please. Well, thank you again. Um, yes, speaking about the Russia-Ukraine, uh, again, my question is on energy security and the sustainability. We know like uh, after the Russia, Ukraine and the pressure from the EU countries uh, uh, to stop the war in Ukraine, they seek uh, to face out the dependence on the Russia. And Qatar has been one of the countries that uh, the, the EU has, you know, uh, uh, spoke to uh, uh, so that Qatar can provide natural gas uh, for, for the EU. 
Um, my question is, uh, to what extent uh, can Qatar, you know, you know, this is happening, you know, uh, at the time where we also uh, face challenges of the climate change and we uh, all want to uh, meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, I, I wonder to what extent Qatar uh, also bring the climate discussion when it comes to uh, signing new agreements, natural gas agreements with the EU. Thank you, Ash. As you know, LNG is the most effective and the, the most, uh, uh, I would say, clean energy compared to other fossil fuels. And we are exporter of LNG, so we believe that LNG is uh, uh, at least uh, uh, very critical in the transitional period to renewable uh, energies and to using renew renewable energies. Plus, Qatar Energy has invested in uh, carbon capture uh, technologies. I can get you the, the data and the exact uh, specifics after after the session on how that technology works and how many uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide it would, uh, it would absorb. Uh, so uh, Qatar, Qatar has stressed that it cannot replace Russian gas, gas at least not in the immediate uh, term. Uh, due to technical uh, uh, technical issues and the the capacities of the production uh, but on the on the long run we believe in the long run that lng will be critical and key to, in the transitional period to renewable energies uh, uh, because it is uh, produces the less uh, carbon dioxide and it is the most effective compared to other uh, fossil fuels Aisha, you look like you have a follow up question yes, okay. yes. yes. Oh. Ash, I have to uh, reiterate <laughs> that I'm not an environmental expert. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is not, it is environmental and uh, related to the human rights as well. Uh, actually, I have been invited uh, to, to go to Germany and I've been to Germany and I was invited to speak about the climate and the environmental initiatives in the Gulf. And the first picture I saw when I was there to present is like, uh, you know, the the uh, the German minister, uh, I think, of the foreign affairs uh, with the Qatar uh, minister of foreign affairs, where they uh, spoke about the uh, natural gas uh, agreement between the two. Um, being in Germany and speaking to the German citizens there, they are so pretty much concerned. First, about natural gas is not really clean. And the other thing is that, they again, it's about the disinformation and the image of the Qatar. Uh, and they, the citizens are putting pressure on the government not to take the agreement because of the human rights issues. So I wonder to what extent, as, uh, uh, as, a, as a government, you play a role also to clear up that misinformation about Qatar in terms of the human rights. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, double standards come to play here, and big time. And uh, maybe some countries think they can bully Qatar because it's a small state, but it's something that we will never accept. Yes, we 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 are working on improving our human rights records and making uh, the law strong and intact for all sects that uh, live in Qatar. But uh, but the criticism has been unfair and biased, and we have communicated clearly our message. Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of stereotypes that have accumulated over the years, uh, uh, people do not have the maybe the will willing uh, the willingness to to listen. Unfortunately, but I think that's an issue that they have to resolve. From our side, we will always stress on dialogue, understanding, and creating bridges. Uh, and uh, I, and I think there's an issue of double standards there. If you're gonna mix human rights with the with uh, with business, then uh, there are many other countries that they do business with happily, uh, without uh, mentioning the human rights element. So I wonder why are they uh, virtue signaling with Qatar only and not uh, other countries without naming any of them? Especially if you look at who are they depending on energy for the past uh, few decades, and uh, w was uh, human rights just a recent uh, trend for them when it came to Qatar? Thank you, Ibrahim. I think this discussion could go on forever. But uh, let me wrap up the dialogue because I have one question, one more question, and one final question, which I think is fitting to, to end this dialogue, which is on 
on ASEAN and, and you know, because the theme today is about communication and communicating credibility, what would you say and what's your message uh, about what more can be done in Qatar's relations with, with ASEAN nations, including Singapore? I was uh, saying in a meeting earlier in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that I have a problem personally, this is not an official position, with the term of the Middle East. Because when we say Middle East and North Africa, North Africa is a geographic location, but Middle East is a direction. Middle East to what? So technically we are in West Asia, we are part of Asia, and this is our home continent. So when we're speaking about Asian relations, it's about relations with our neighbors and with our immediate surrounding. Uh, to answer your question, we already have a strong uh, economic relations uh, with the ASEAN countries and uh, Asia in general. And the, the natural next step for Qatar uh, and uh, uh, for this relationship to foster is to build on this economic relationship with a strategic relationship in all fields, whether it's uh, uh, defense, culture, uh, investments, uh, education, etc., uh, because we are united in uh, geography, we're united in, in faith, and this is the natural next step and the organic next step sh we should take to uh, further boost our relations. And this is the direction we're we're heading to. We recognize in Qatar the importance of uh, Asia as our home continent and as our, our main economic partner and the importance to build on that uh, relationship. Thank you, Ibrahim, and I enjoy your optimism. And I guess this ends our conversation on a very positive note. So I'd like to thank everyone in attendance, Your Excellency as well, and also those who are tuning in on Zoom. Thank you very much for putting in your question and staying engaged with our discussion. And we hope to see you more on MEI events. Of course, this is the 17th session of the Bridging the Gulf series. We hope to see you on the 18th, inshallah. <laughs>